Star Wars fans in the house. Come on, any Star Wars fans? We don't have, we got a couple. Come on. I don't know if you've seen uh, the, the, the new show, The Mandalorian, uh, but it's honestly, it's a personal favorite of mine. I love The Mandalorian, I love Star Wars. And so today in week two of At The Movies, we're gonna look at the movie The Mandalorian. The Mandalorian uh, infamously, he's got this line and he says, this is the way. And the Mandalorian is about um, a Mandalorian, and he's called Mando, and, and uh, the, the, the series kind of follows him, and, and he's, he's a, a real uh, strong into the law of being a Mandalorian. He doesn't take off his helmet. You know, he, he, he wears all this shiny armor and uh, that only Mandalorians can, can wear. And all throughout, uh, when people maybe don't understand what he's doing or what's happening, he goes, this is the way. And in the show, The Mandalorian, you know, he falls uh, kind of um, in, in love and, and, and with, with this character uh, to care for it. Uh, and it looks like a little baby Yoda. But if you're a real Star Wars fan, don't call him baby Yoda uh, because uh, they, they, they get a little offended by calling him baby Yoda. But he looks like a baby Yoda. And the story follows how, how Mando is protecting the child. And, 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 and this little green goblin looking thing is, is, is the child. And uh, he says, this is, this is the way when he's doing some unconventional things, maybe some self-sacrificing things for the child, this is the way. And so it reminded me of a scripture that I really wanna preach from today. It's John 14. Turn with me there. John chapter 14, if you have your Bibles. And as you're turning there, I'm going to share a joke. You thought I forgot about it, didn't you? Grandpa Jones was celebrating his 100th birthday. Everybody complimented him on how authentic and well-preserved he appeared. Gentlemen, I'll tell you the secret of my success, he cackled. I've been in the open air day after day for some 75 years now. The celebrants were impressed and asked how he managed to keep up his rigorous fitness regime. He said, well, you see, my wife and I were married 75 years ago. On our wedding night, we made a solemn pledge. Whenever we had a fight, the one who was proved wrong would go outside and take a walk. Come on. You live a married life, you have a happy life, if, if, if you just say, I was, baby, you were right, I was wrong. Come on. Hey, let, let, let's dive into the word. I'm sure you've already got it. If you don't, they've got it on the screens for you. It says this, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. These are the words of Jesus speaking. There, there's more than enough room in my father's home. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said, no, we don't know, Lord. We have no idea where you're going. So how can we know the way? Say that with me. Say the way. Come on, say it again. Say the way. The way. The way. Jesus told them, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you, ha if you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and we'll be satisfied. Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe 
of the work that you have seen me do. Verse six is what we're gonna focus on today. It says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Can we pray as we, as we dive into the word? Father, we thank you for the word of God that brings life to us. God, it teaches us how to live our life. And Lord, I pray today, the words I speak over the next little bit, God, will not be from my heart, but God, they will be directly from your word, from your spirit. And so Lord, today, we open up our hearts, we open up our minds, we open up our ears to hear the word of the Lord. And all God's people said, amen. See, I don't know if there's anybody in here, but um, uh, my, my wife and I, we, we like to think that we like to hike. Anybody in here like hiking? Um, but my wife and I, we, we like to think we like hiking. You know, the idea sounds great. Uh, you know, uh, we, were, we were away this week and we were in the mountains and, and so we're like, man, let, let's go hiking. Let's, let's walk up this cliff. And, and we have our two and a half year old daughter with us. And uh, have you ever been hiking with a two and a half year old? Um, yeah, it'll test your marriage. If you, if you wanna know how strong your marriage is, go hiking with a two and a half year old. You wanna know how close to Jesus you are? Come on, go hiking with a two and a half year old. Um, but but we, have, we, we have an idea that we, we like to hike. We like the idea of hiking, but, but the reality of it isn't uh, maybe as, as real as our desire for it. But I, I'm, I'm not sure why Kins and I this week decided to, to take a two and a half year old hiking around Big Sur, where we're going up these mountains and these side streets and uh, everywhere we'd walk. My, my daughter would go, Daddy, Uppy. And, and, and Uppy is, you know, she speaks great English, but for whatever reason, she thinks up please is just uppy. And so she goes, Daddy, uppy, I don't want to walk. And I'm like, baby, we're walking up these mountains. Your legs are a lot fresher than mine. We're, you got you to gotta walk. So we're teaching her how to walk on a path of a trail. And so, you know, we're, we're hiking and there's trees all around and there's these beautiful, you know, bushes and these flowers and, and a, a trail, you know, it's just, it's small, it's a path. And I said, baby, we just gotta stay on the path. If we stay on the path, we're gonna be all right. But, you know, we're walking and all of a sudden, all I hear is, Wah! and I'm like, what in the world? I look behind, my daughter is just right behind me and she had walked off the path and she was just walking around and she had tripped and she fell and she was crying and, and she's like, daddy, uppy. And I'm like, baby, if you would have just stayed on the path, you would have been all right. That, that, that hiking and the journey in which you hike is a lot easier when you know the right path. And what I love about God is he didn't just, just start life and, and say, hey, you're on it on your own, but he gave us a path to follow. He gave us a path that is going to lead the right way. Life is easier when you know the right path. And so today, we're going to look at the right, the right path. It's easier when you follow the right path. God has given us the right path to live a life of fulfillment. That when you follow the path that God has for you, it will be the greatest hike that you've ever been on. When you stay on the path, when you stay in the way and the word of the Lord, you will have the adventure of a lifetime. You will live and end your life with a fulfilling life. See, here's what I know. Jesus is the path to an abundant life. Jesus is a path to the abundant life. Jesus says this, that the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have life more abundantly, that Jesus is the path to the abundant life. I want somebody to understand this. Jesus is not the killjoy of life. Jesus is not the one that wants to keep you from having fun and keep you from achieving all that you can achieve in life. No, Jesus is the path and the way to an abundant life. So we're going to look at this. We're going to look at three things today that Jesus says he is. This is the way, the truth, and the life. The first thing, if you're taking notes, Jesus is the way to God. 
He says, I am the way. Well, to what? He says, to the Father. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way to God. It's important that we understand this. We understand the, 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 the simple uh, doctrinal theological statement. Jesus is not a way. He is the way. He's not one way to God. He is the way to God. He is the way to the Father. No person comes to the Father except through Jesus. In Matthew 16, verses 13 through 16, it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then Jesus asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. See, it doesn't matter what the world says about Jesus. It doesn't matter what your parents say about Jesus. It doesn't matter what your siblings or, or your friends say about Jesus. At the end of the day, what matters is this. What matters is who you say that Jesus is. What matters is what we say about Jesus. Is he just a, another prophet? Is he just Elijah? Is he just a good man or a good teacher? Or is he the son of the living God, yeah. God in flesh, came to dwell in, in, on earth to take our place on a cross and he rose again on a third day? Who do we say that Jesus is? See, the, the world can have all their opinions about who Jesus is. And as Christians, we become so consumed about what other people think about Jesus, but we forget what matters is who I say that Jesus is. Yeah. So you can't control everybody else. We can't control the actions of the world. They're wicked. It's just part of it. But yet we're surprised when they deny who Jesus is. But if we aren't careful, we become so focused on what the world says about Jesus that we forget what matters is that what matters is what I say about Jesus. What matters is, is who I proclaim Jesus to be. See, Jesus has to be one of three things. He has to be a liar, a lunatic, or he has to be Lord. Write that down. Liar, a lunatic, or Lord. C.S. Lewis most infamously said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing you must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be a liar, the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. We have to answer the question for each of us, was Jesus a liar? Was Jesus a lunatic? Or was, he said, or was he who he said he was, was, is he our Lord? So there's only three possibilities that we, can, that, we, that we can reconcile with Jesus. First, he is who he says he is. Right. He really is the way. He really is the truth. He really is the life. That you can't get to the Father except through him. Right. That's the first of the, the possibilities. The second is that, that he wasn't who he says he was. And, and he knew that he wasn't who he said he was. Well, if he made this statement and he knew that he was not who he said he was, he would be a liar. No great good moral teacher 
would be a good moral teacher if their teachings were full of lies. And then third possibility is that he wasn't who he said he was and he didn't know it, which would make him a lunatic, make him insane. You think you're God. So if today, man, you're thinking about faith and you're looking at Jesus, you, I like him, but I don't like this. He's the way and not a way. You either have to accept Jesus as Lord or reject him as liar and lunatic because Jesus is just laying it plain out right here, right now. I am the way. See, it's no coincidence that that the same language here is the language where God presented himself to Moses as, who are you? I am. I am the, I am the way. See, defining who Jesus is is so important because it's through this definition of who Jesus is that we must either accept or reject Jesus. See, me personally, I've come to the conclusion that Jesus is not a liar or a lunatic. He did not lead the biggest deception of all time. He wasn't the devil from hell. Rather, Jesus is who he said he is, the man that split history, the man that walked this world and healed, the man that historically went to the cross, was crucified, resurrected, is who he said he is the man that the disciples all went and died as martyrs protecting the integrity of what Jesus said about himself and never departed from who Jesus is that he is who he said he is. I've come to say, God, I I, I know you to be Lord, not liar and lunatic. But we have too many people that are self-proclaimed Christians that go, well, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I also believe that there are other ways to maybe get to God. You either have to accept him as Lord or reject him as liar and lunatic. How do you get to the Father? Jesus. If you're taking notes, Jesus is the door to which we enter the Father's house. Matthew 7, 13 through 14 says, you can enter God's kingdom only, notice this, only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way, but the gateway to life is very narrow. The road is difficult and only a few ever find it. Jesus It's the only way to the kingdom of God. Jesus is the door. Jesus is the narrow gate. Now listen, a lot of my friends, I have a lot of friends that that are not believers and and, and one of the common hangups that I hear about Christianity is this, well, Christianity is just too exclusive for an all-loving God. We have to be very careful that as humans... In our humanity, we don't think we're more loving than a loving God. We got a lot of people that we think we're more loving than God. But the, the, that God in his omniscience and his omnipresence and, and his all-knowingness, that he is all, all loving. You see, the message of Christ is the most inclusive message ever given. We have got to flip the script that Christianity is not exclusive. It is inclusive. Well, Tyler, what what, what do you mean It's, it's inclusive? Jesus said this, John 3, 16, for this is how God loved the world. Who? The world. Not the Jews, not the Gentiles, not the young, not the old, not the white, not the black, not, not, not just a certain people. He loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone, come on, 
Everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. You see, the message of Christ is not exclusive, it is inclusive. In fact, it's the most inclusive message ever given that anyone, no matter their background, no matter their education, no matter their age or demographic, anyone can find their way to the Father through Jesus. Jesus is the most inclusive message because he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. He says, I will give you rest. Jesus is the way to God. See, God loves everyone, red, yellow, black, and white, as they taught us in Sunday school. They are precious in his sight. So much. He gave himself to die for us in our place. The God of all creation, the creator of the universe, took on human flesh, went to a cross. Scripture says in him there was no sin, but sin was put on top of him. He became the substitution for our wrong, for your wrong, for the world's wrong. He died on the cross, was buried in a borrowed tomb, and on the third day, he rose, he rose again. He ascended to heaven, and he's coming back again. See, Jesus got what we deserved so that we could get what he deserved. Jesus came and took our penalty of death and got what we deserved so that we could inherit what he deserved. Just like the song we're, we're singing, that we are seated through Christ at the right hand of the Father, undefeated with him. The, the scripture says that we, through Jesus, have become the righteousness of God. That when God looks at us, he doesn't see us, but he sees the righteousness of of Jesus. So Jesus is the way to God. Point number two, Jesus is the way to truth. Jesus is the way to truth. See, the world and culture will have you think that the way to truth is through self-experience. But Jesus says this, that he is the way to truth. And in and, and my generation, you might have, have heard this, but, but there's a popular phrase, and, and, and it's called my truth. And everybody is on their journey to figuring out their own truths to themselves. And, and how you find your truth and how I find my truth is through self-experience. So then truth is a relative thing. It's not a constant thing. It's a relative thing dependent on our own self-experience. Well, here's what I want to let you know on, on, on what's maybe a little faulty with that is that there is no truth because my experience is different from your experience. So then my truth might not be your truth. Then there is no constant truth. And then we're constantly changing our emotions or changing our, our thoughts based off our emotions. Our character and our integrity is changing based off the situation that we're facing. Now there's no constant truth truth in a society and when you can degrade a constant truth from society you can just lead it on through the next best emotional argument you see you can live by your truth or as Christians we can choose to live the way of truth and Jesus says I am the truth See, as a believer, the truth that we have in Jesus trumps our personal truth. I'm going to say that again because some young people need to hear that today. Uh, I, I need to hear it. Maybe some older people need to hear it today. The truth of who Jesus is, the truth of the gospel, the truth of the word of God should trump your personal truth. It should overpower what my truth is, what my experience says 
This, my experience labels me a victim, but the truth of the gospel says you are not a victim, but you reign with Christ victorious over everything. That yes, there will be trial and tribulations and problems, but you are not your circumstances. You are who you are in Jesus, the truth. See, truth is not dependent on my circumstances or my experience, but rather truth is dependent on who Jesus is. We gotta ask ourselves, what is the filter of truth in our life? What's the filter of truth in our life? Is it our self-experience or is it Jesus? See, I'm, I'm, I'm a coffee drinker and... I like coffee. I'm, I'm not a, my, my wife likes Keurig and, and that, that's fine. It's good for a quick cup of coffee. But, but for me, uh, I'll, I'll go real nerdy with you. I like third wave coffee. First wave coffee is your Folgers in a cup. Second wave coffee is like your Starbucks. Third wave coffee is, is uh, like micro roasting and light and medium roast and everything's done with slow brewing. So for me, I like a Chemex. I like a pour over. I like a, a, um, uh, a, a slow brewing. Bar and I enjoy slowly brewing coffee. It takes about five minutes to, to brew one cup of coffee and it's all done by hand. I enjoy it. It's therapeutic to me. There's something about the smell and, and there's something satisfying about I made this full cup myself. And depending on how you brew it and the time and the pace of, of, the, of, of, of the water flow determines the flavor that you get out of this, the coffee beans. But I want you to know, it is a technique that I've had to learn. It's a technique that, that I, I had to actually kind of study. And uh, depending on, your, on your, um, your, your brewing method, you have these different filters, and a Chemex specifically, I, I should have brought it. I got one in my office. I should have brought it. I'll use it for the next service as an illustration. But this Chemex, uh, you have this filter, and it's literally just a paper like this, and you've got to fold it a certain way. And you fold it in such a way that actually you put the coffee grinds in it and the water, and it keeps the, the coffee grinds from falling in. And how I use that filter determines the purity of the coffee. Now, when I first started brewing coffee, um, I I might have folded it wrong a couple times. And when you fold it wrong, you're going to get a cup of coffee with coffee grounds all in it, and I promise you, you're not going to like it. It's going to be nasty. You're going to toss it out. It's going to be five minutes wasted (laughs) with, 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 with your coffee. But if you fold the filter the right way, if you fold it the right way, you'll be able to have a great cup of coffee. I, I think this is sort of the same for some of us spiritually, that maybe we don't have the right filter for which to see what is truth, and, and what happens is we end up getting coffee grinds in our life. We end up with problems in our life, and we don't know, how did I get in this problem? It's because you are filtering things happening in your life through the wrong lens. Yeah. I'm just gonna give you an example for for how we can filter things through the lens of of Jesus instead of the lens of the world. (laughs) Paul says this, he says, as believers, we don't grieve the dead like the world grieves the dead. As believers, we have a filter that yes, there is sorrow, there is grief, there is a time and a season from mourning, but we don't grieve like the unrighteous world. We grieve with hope, knowing that there is hope on the other side, that there is a glory still ahead of us, that there is a hell to be shunned and a heaven to gain. And to die in Christ is much gain. It's one way that we use the filter, but here's what I know. If you are filtering through your experience, you're going to walk through death and, and you're going to walk through pain and suffering with, with uncertainty. You're going to walk through it based off how you feel instead of recognizing that, that someone that has accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior is now with God in eternity. How we filter truth is so Important. If Jesus isn't your filter of what truth is in your life, your emotions and opinions will be ever changing. 
We have to make sure that we have the right filter for what we're facing in life. (laughs) Are my emotions my filter or is Jesus my filter for what truth is? See, Jesus is the full expression of who God is on earth. See, the law was was just a glimpse of who God was. The law was a glimpse of who God was. Jesus, when he came, he unveiled the curtain of who God is and what he's like. By seeing Jesus, we've seen God, that when Jesus healed, God healed. When Jesus came against the Pharisees, God came against the Pharisees. When Jesus reached down to the woman caught in the middle of adultery and he said, go and sin no more, God did that. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. God, show us the Father. Jesus said, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen The Father, here's what I know, that when you see Jesus, you see God. We need a fresh revelation of who Jesus is. We need a fresh revelation of of, of the Son of Man, of the Son of God in our life. Point number three, if you're taking notes, Jesus is the way to life. Say that with me. The way to life. Say it again. The way to life. John 10, 10. The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich, satisfying life. The King King James says, I've come that you may have life and life more abundantly. Here's what I know and what I've found. You will never be fully satisfied until you find the way to the satisfying life. What happens is we become like a a two-and-a-half-year-old with our faith, and and the path is before us, and and our Father has said, hey, here is the path to the abundant life. Here is the path to the satisfying life. But then we get distracted, and we look at all the trees, and we look at the mountains, and we look at the weeds, and we walk away from the path, and we're wandering around. We might could still see our Father in a distance, and we think we're okay, but we're walking around we're not on the path and then what happens is then we become tripped up and, and something, so something becomes a stumbling block for us. Well, well, what happens is we got off the path. Yeah. We think, wow, that tree and those flowers look pretty. Maybe that will satisfy me. But I've come to, to let you know you will only be fully satisfied until you find the way to the satisfying life. Jesus is the way to a rich, satisfying life, life more abundantly. Jesus is the way to having joy in the midst of suffering. Jesus is the way to having peace in the midst of the storm. Jesus is the way to looking back at the end of your life and saying, never have I seen the righteous forsaken (laughs) Romans says the wages of sin is death but the gift of God come on the gift of God is eternal life the gift of God for each of us is eternal life see I want to be able to at the end of my life, when I'm on my deathbed, should the Lord tarry, to be able to look back and say, never have I seen the righteous forsaken. God has been faithful. I may not have been the richest man, may not have seen maybe some things around the world that I wanted to see, but, but listen, my, my family's in health. My, my kids love Jesus. I've, I've lived an abundant life an abundant life. That when I walk through heartache, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I was able to fear no evil. See, Psalms chapter 92 says, the godly will flourish like palm trees and glow and grow strong like cedars of Lebanon. For they're transplanted to the Lord's own house. They'll flourish in the courts of our God. 
Here's what I want us to see. Even in old age, they will still produce fruit. They will remain vital and green. They will declare, the Lord is just. He is my rock. There is no evil in him. When you trust the way to life, Jesus, at the end of your life, you will be able to say, the Lord is just. He has been my rock, and I have never found any evil in him. When I get to the end of my days, I want to be able to proclaim and declare that God is still good. I want to be able not, not to sit on my deathbed jaded and, 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 and just, 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 just cast over and, and with, with the things of life. I want to be able to say, my God has been faithful. My God has been good. My God has been just. Yeah, I didn't understand it when I was walking through it, but I chose to put my faith in the way. And I've come to know God as good. I've come to tell somebody today, find your God purpose in Jesus. That when you retire, it's not a time to check out for the things of God. It's a time to turn up on the God purpose that he has for you. It's a time to to be an example to your family of of what it is to to live a God-purposed life to bear fruit in old age. I've come to tell someone, lay down your truth so that you can pick up Jesus' truth. You can't hold on to the truth of who Jesus is and still hold on to my truth. But what if God asks me to give up something that's so dear to me? I promise that God will never make you lay down something so terrible that it will ever outweigh eternity, eternal life, and abundance in heaven.